Hello everyone, while we're waiting for people to funnel in, uh, you can just uh, get acquainted with uh, who's up uh, here right now. Uh, first off, let me introduce our CFO, uh, Holly Duplain. Holly, you can start speaking if you'd like. Hello everyone, um, my name is Holly Duplain. I'm the CFO for the YMCA of Greater Cleveland. Um, welcome to our viewers out there. Um, this is our first session in building the foundation for your financial future. It is the first in a three-part series um, sponsored by First National Bank and presented by the YMCA of Greater Cleveland. We're very excited to put this on today on this very important topic for our community. And I'd like to thank First National Bank for their sponsorship and for the panelists, Stefan and Chris, who are with us today. We will be showing you a video the video will address common questions for young people that ask about financial planning. After the video, we will have a live Q&A session um, with our panelists. So please submit any questions you might have into the chat box and enjoy the video, sit back, and at the end, we will open it up for a live Q&A. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Kenny, the Creative Director for the YMCA of Greater Cleveland, and it is my pleasure to introduce Jay Stephan Holmes and Chris Barker of First National Bank, who are joining us to discuss the importance of building a strong financial foundation at an early age. Well, Ryan, thanks for having us. It's our pleasure to be here, and as uh, we're excited to at least share some information about uh, financial literacy and how people can become uh, better at managing their finances. Uh, I've been with uh, First National for almost four years. I've been in the banking industry for over 30, so uh, yeah. I'm d I definitely have some experience, and I was very lucky uh, throughout my years uh, to be at different job functions uh, at the bank. So I started off as our community reinvestment officer. Uh, I morphed into our, our retail division, and I managed our branches. Uh, I became uh, a lender with the uh, SBA administration, Small Business Administration. And for the past 10 years, uh, I, uh, my functions are really to manage our government uh, banking uh, division, uh, which specializes in providing financing to public funded entities, school districts, municipalities. Right, well, and like Stefan, I've also been with the bank about five years and I've also been in the financial industry for about 30 years. I have a varied background starting from my float teller days right out of right out of college. Um, I worked at a bank call center. Um, I ended up running an operations department for all deposits and for loans. I did some project management. And most recently, I've been a branch manager, which I really enjoy. It does give me the opportunity to work with a lot of people to help educate them about the different products and services that we offer at the bank. So thank you for having us today. We plan on covering a number of topics with you today to set you off on the right foot financially, uh, including protecting your finances, creating a budget, managing a checking account, and establishing and maintaining strong credit scores, and much more. Throughout this session, Chris and Stefan will provide sound advice on where to go to seek reliable information, best practices, and what potential challenges may arise along the way to achieving your financial goals. At the end of this session, I encourage you to ask questions related to our discussion after it concludes. So let's start off our conversation today by discussing financial health. Most people are aware of the physical and mental health and what steps you can take to improve in those areas, but what does it mean to be financially healthy? Well, it's worth noting that financial health means something different to everyone, especially depending on where you are at in life. Generally speaking, the characteristics you can use to describe someone with positive financial health would be earning enough to cover your weekly and monthly expenses, and being debt-free or having a manageable amount of debt, and also feeling confident about your financial future. For example, um, if you, when you're spending on money, things that bring you joy, hopefully you're not concerned that you spent too much money and you don't have enough left over to pay your expenses. And another thing is having an emergency savings. That's something that you like to build up to and eventually saving enough money to be able to retire at a comfortable age. And along with that, throughout your credit life, throughout your life, um, you want to maintain great or even excellent credit. And we'll go over ways that you can accomplish that. What can someone do to get on the right track toward becoming financially fit? 
Well, as Chris was saying, uh, it really comes down to common sense. Um, you need to live within your means. Uh, you, you need to start having a, a budget. Uh, and it's always good to have a goal uh, in anything that you do in life. And your, your financial stability uh, also requires some planning. And, you know, have, have a goal to, to vision what you want to be in a year, five years, ten years, and to uh, set some steps to, to accomplish that. It sounds like the path to financial success starts with establishing positive money habits early. What would you say would be the three most beneficial takeaways this audience can use today that will help them to establish good financial habits? Well, first off, it is really important to create a budget. It'll help you identify where maybe you're spending a little bit too much money, you know, wasting money. Um, it will help you create new habits. It can reduce stress because you're actually budgeting your money and you'll know when your expenses come due that the money has been set aside. So you'll really want to distinguish between your wants and your needs when creating the budget. And you're right, Chris. You can use uh, different tools and, and resources to track where your budget uh, is at any given mm -hmm. time. And to see uh, that way, it's also very helpful in seeing where your money is, is going. Um, I still find it amazing when I track down my, my monthly expenses, what I do spend money on, uh, and it's caused me to change some habits. Um, you know, during COVID, um, my uh, online experiences through, <laughs> through TV and, and, and other uh, streaming services uh, have, have really exceeded what I had originally planned. But, you know, we adjust. So it is helpful by writing those down and keeping track of what you spend. Right, I agree with you on that, Stefan. In fact, I, I've noticed the same thing. You know, when I look at our online banking, we have the budget tool. So I was just looking at it last week and wow, I, I really spent a lot more money on that online shopping. So I need <laughs> to get back to my, my regimented budget. Yeah, isn't that the truth? We, I've seen more, more Amazon trucks in my neighborhood in the, in the last few months than I ever saw before in life. I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Uh, what are some common mistakes that teens make with their money that might impact their financial health? Okay, so something that I commonly see with um, teens is overdrafting their account. <laughs> you know, they get their debit card and they know they deposited money and on a whim, maybe they want to go out, you know, go buy clothes or purchase dinner. And just because the card works, the debit card works, they assume the money's in there. And a couple days later, they, they forgot that maybe they paid another bill. And so then they're hit with an overdraft fee. So I would say really monitoring your account is key for anyone, in particular teens, that are just starting out with their first account. And again, not building a budget. So that goes right along with, okay, when I use this card, I need to think, is that part of my, my needs or is it part of my wants? Let's get into some of the basic financial tools out there that people can take advantage of to support them in their financial journey, as well as some of the obstacles they may encounter. And uh, let's start with one of the most basic financial tools, a checking account. Can you explain what a checking account is and why people in the audience should have one? Uh, sure. Uh, a checking account is really the, the basis of, of uh, all financial services. Um, it's been replaced. I'm, I'm, you know, I told you how long I've been in the banking business, so the, I, I still write a few checks. It's been replaced a lot by your debit card and, uh, and other online right. uh, payment tools, but it is, it is something very basic where, quite frankly, it is, it's a tracking mechanism uh, to pay uh, bills. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's been replaced a lot by use of debit cards and other online payment services, but is the very basic fundamental of, of, of uh, starting your, your financial plan and your financial wealth. Today, as, as we've, we've talked about, um, and, and Chris knows it better than I, uh, there are many tools offered by a number of financial institutions, ours are no different, where we actually have digital wallets um, that, that coexist with your debit card, which is a great way of letting you know where you stand at any given time with your balances in your in your accounts. Um, right, Stefan, you're absolutely right. Um, one of my favorite products that we have is our online banking tool and also our mobile banking tool. So we have an app. And with that, you know, you can use facial recognition right away. You can take a look at all of your accounts, your balances, the transactions, 
Um, if you need to transfer money between accounts, you can do that in a matter of seconds, just a few simple clicks. And something else that's really neat, a great tool we have, you know, as Steph was talking about debit cards, we were talking about how debit card is how you really can sometimes get into trouble by using it a little too frequently. And um, we have Card Guard, which um, allows our customers to turn their card on and off. Say you misplace your card, you can go ahead and block it. Then you don't have to worry about if, you know, if it's in someone else's hands. But another nice um, tool is you can actually set up alerts. Um, so like I set up a threshold where if my debit card is used for more than a penny, um, that I get an alert. So I know right away when it's being used. And and another really nice feature is the fact that, um, say that you have an account with your child and they tend to spend too much money with their debit card, you can set limits and you can even block certain types of merchants. So really the mobile banking and online banking, they have so many really great features that keep you on top of your finances. So it, it really does provide a safeguard. And you're, you're so correct. And one of the things that we always stress when we talk to customers, new and old customers, uh, and you, you hear a lot about, there are a lot of um, uh, news stories about fraud. And, you know, quite frankly, the, 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 it's, it, they're real. Uh, the numbers have uh, increased exponentially over the last few years. People are becoming more sophisticated on how they can uh, use your, your accounts uh, for, for their purposes and not yours. And so uh, most of the apps, if not all, I know ours does, mm -hmm. have, have fraud uh, protection services. So as long as you monitor your accounts and alert the bank, um, those, those, those fees most often can be mitigated. But with our debit cards, you know, the most a customer could ever be responsible for if there's fraud is $500. But in all of my years, um, as long as a customer does the right thing and it truly is fraud on their account, they never end up paying a penny. You know, the funds do end up being refunded to their account, and we, we take precautions to make sure it doesn't happen again. We help educate our customers. Are there different types of checking accounts? How do you pick the best one for you? So yes, we have a lot of checking accounts. Um, on the personal checking accounts, there are different features you want to look at. So we have an account where there's no minimum balance required, and there's not a monthly service fee. We have accounts that uh, maybe require a, a, a particular balance in order to waive the monthly service fee, but maybe you're getting interest on that account. Then we have student checking accounts. Um, we have accounts where re really um, you can get some perks such as having foreign ATM fees ref um, refunded and getting free checks. So we have a great variety of accounts. And Chris, just to highlight the uh, the foreign ATM, because it may not the people may not understand, mm -hmm. most banks that offer uh, your your debit cards, um, there is no fee usually when they when they go to the bank that they've opened the account with. If you're going to a, a bank that you don't have your account with, which we title in the business as foreign, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes there is a transaction fee. So we belong to the All Point Network that offers over twenty thousand. Uh, access points to ATM. So most oftentimes if you're uh, at the gas station or in a grocery store and, it, and it's not one of your particular bank's ATMs, our, our, we will waive those, those fees, which we call foreign bank fees. So there are, there are a lot of different advantages um, to really shopping around to get the best type of checking and debit account that fits your needs. Absolutely. There's no reason why you should be worrying about being charged a monthly service fee and, you know, can I afford my account? There are ways for us definitely to make it a very cost effective and non-fee account for you. How would someone open up a new checking account and set it up? Okay, it's very simple for a customer to open a checking account. If you're someone that prefers to open accounts online, of course that is an option. Through our online banking, you simply select the product that you want and you can go through the steps to open it online or you can even select the option to make an appointment with your local branch. So then you come on into the local branch, um, we're expecting you because you set up that appointment and we're more than happy to open the account that way. Always remember when you do come into the branch or even online, uh, there are some basic documents that you'll need for identification purposes. We talked about fraud a little bit, but this is the, this is the first door uh, to prevent that. So we wanna make sure that the person opening the account um, is indeed the person that'll be using the account. 
So what do we need? Uh, quite simply, driver's license or other sort of government ID, um, utility bill so that we can verify your address, right. uh, social security card and or birth certificate, uh, standard forms of making sure that you are who you say you are, which uh, it really helps prevent fraud uh, or, or someone else using your account uh, down the line. It sure does. And a lot of times, you know, customers, you know, existing customers um, might have had their information compromised outside of the bank. And sometimes they call and say, oh, make sure you don't let anyone withdraw the money from my account. And my response always is, well, because we thoroughly identified you when you opened your account, we have your personal private information that other people don't have. So please rest assured that, you know, we do what we need to make sure that when you come in the off, when you come into our branch, you are who you say you are. Now, earlier you guys mentioned overdraft fees. Do you have any guidance or tips on how they could be avoided? <laughs> I, I smile because, mm -hmm. um, yes, it's really one of monitoring your usage. And, you know, and, and it's really easy when you get into a habit of using your debit card for all sorts of payments uh, to, to, to go over the amount that you have. But again, as Chris was saying earlier, uh, we do have apps available to help you keep on track of that. But I would suggest, especially if you are a daily debit card user, uh, daily you need to check your account balances. It's really just a function of knowing how much you have available in your account. Uh, and you talk about account availability, especially with, with um, first time or, or younger users, you have an account balance but you also have an available balance. Right, right. And what you want to do is you really want to take a look at your available balance because as you're using your debit card, um, typically those funds will be subtracted from your balance and it'll show you what's available to use. So always look at your available balance. Um, and there's a couple other tools that I suggest that especially first time checking account account holders use. Um, when you open the, an account, we ask you if you want to opt in or opt out of um, basically when you use your debit card for an ATM withdrawal or for a purchase at a merchant. If you opt out, what it means is that we will only give an authorization. We will only allow that transaction to go through if the funds are available in your account. Okay, if you opt in, what happens is either the computer is able to look at your account history to think, okay, you know what, I think this person would be okay if we allow them to overdraw their account by $200. And so if you opt in, when you use your debit card, maybe you don't have enough money, but we know that you're good for up to $200. We'll let that transaction go through. However, you'll, you will be charged an overdraft fee. So for newer customers, and when I talk to them and their parents, it's kind of like when in doubt, opt out. Once you see that you've actually been monitoring your account and you're not an overdraft risk type customer, then we can consider opting in. So that's just a tool, something that I think is important to consider. And one other thing that is very helpful, um, perhaps you want to save, set up a savings account that is linked to your checking account for overdraft purposes. So that way, say that you do make a mistake and you overdraw your checking account by $10, then funds can automatically be transferred from your first national bank savings account, saving the $37 overdraft fee. And again, I can't stress enough. Um, we, we have at, at First National an interactive website uh, and an application that is basically um, set up to help you uh, keep track of your spending. And, but it's only good if you use it. True. And so I would say if you use your debit card daily, uh, check it daily. It, it, it takes all of 30 seconds. Right. And again, that's part of the education. Um, I think first time debit card users, when you're really monitoring the activity, some little quirks that you'll find, if you use your debit card for gas, if you use it like a credit card, you'll find that certain gas stations, maybe they get a $50 authorization just to make sure the card's good. Maybe they only get a $1 authorization to see if the card's good, but then check half an hour later and that odd dollar amount authorization is gone and the actual amount posts to your account. So it's one of the good ways, really watch the transactions, educate your account. That way when you see transactions like that, you're not, you're not concerned and you know that it will self-correct. True.
Let's discuss digital banking now, as it seems to be the most preferred way to bank for many young people. I would agree. I would agree that that is the most preferred way. Um, when I open accounts for um, the younger folks now, and when I ask them if they want me to order checks, typically they're like, I'm never going to write a check. <laughs> so um, they prefer the online bill pay. If you're going to pay someone, use online bill pay. And more often than not, you know, from what I'm talking um, to my new account holders, they ask about Zelle, which is a really easy, free money transfer um, product. So within minutes, you know, say that you need to make your rent payment, um, you just send the money electronically through Zelle and um, the receiver has it typically within 30 seconds to a minute. So it's quick and we do not charge for that service. So yes, using the electronic channels, the digital channels is really the trend in where we see a lot of our new account holders focusing their banking, you know, how they process their banking transactions. What should people take into consideration when choosing a bank? Well, convenience is one, and uh, certainly with all of the new digital technology and convenience, uh, find one that, that fits for you. Uh, find one that, that doesn't charge uh, service fees for your normal daily transactions. Um, find one that uh, communicates to you in the way you'd like to be communicated to. We have several different ways of talking to your banker from a, from a direct phone call to, to, right. to Chris or myself. Uh, to um, online um, operator questions to an 800 number. So whatever works for you, uh, I suggest finding that. What we're, what we're seeing, and that's why you're seeing a number of branches actually consolidating physical locations, mm -hmm. is that the, the trend of the market is going to people going digital and, 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 and utilizing their cell phones uh, for, for conversation. Um, our bank has all of those conveniences, as Chris was talking about, uh, but there are a number of other banks in the, in the area that, that offer similar services. Of course, we think ours is the best, but, right. <laughs> but um, you know, really, you have to find something that's comfortable for you, and uh, that's, that's the key, is uh, something that's comfortable and something that you're going to follow up with on a daily basis, tracking your funds especially when you start utilizing digital services, online services, or your debit card. That's the number one thing that I just want to stress, and I'll continue stressing you know, during this conversation, because that's where people get in trouble when they don't track and check uh, their spending habits and how they're utilizing uh, their, their debit and or checking account. Right, and Stefan, you know, something unusual that First National Bank does have. Um, I know a lot of times when people come to the branch, it's because they truly want face-to-face -face interaction you know, with their banker. And something um, that we do have at a lot of our First National Bank branches is an ITM. It's an interactive teller machine. It's really an ATM on steroids. So say that it's after hours and you know you missed us by half an hour and you really wanted to talk to someone. Well, when you use our ITM, um, there's an option to talk to a person. You press a button or you pick up the phone receiver and one of our customer service representatives actually appears on the screen. The screen. And um, you're able to ask questions. You can cash checks to the penny. You can make auto loan payments. There are so many things you can do, and it's really nice knowing that you got to ask your question face-to-face -face with someone. And if it's something requiring research, you know that person is going to be working on it. So you don't have to wait until the normal branch hours to talk to a live person. I remember the first time I did, I thought it was an avatar at first, and they actually, <laughs> but they actually, they actually came back and talked to us live. So yeah, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the digital uh, capabilities have increased so much now that um, convenience is, is number one in terms of making you comfortable with whatever services you want to have provided by your financial institution. Choosing a bank is definitely an important decision. Uh, another decision a lot of people in the audience have or will make at some point is if they should get a credit card and which one. Uh, can you please explain how credit cards work? I'd be happy to explain how credit cards work. Um, credit cards are one way to borrow money 
and it can be used to make purchases with the understanding that you have to pay the money back um, along with interest if you do not pay the credit card in full. Now, for, for most people, credit card is their first type of debt. It's gonna be the first type of credit they have. And um, when you're searching for a credit card, there's different features to consider. Um, with some credit cards, you can earn rewards, you know, such as you can earn rewards in the way that you can choose gift cards, you can earn rewards as far as maybe crediting money back to your account, or even travel credits. And also um, with credit cards, something important to look at is, is there an annual fee? Do I actually have to pay every year or every month for having this card? Ideally, you wanna get a card where you're not paying to have it. And another, um, another point, another important thing to look at is the interest rate. If you're not able to pay your balance in full every month, how much interest, how much are you paying to borrow this money? Um, and something, I was even thinking about this earlier when we were talking about setting up a budget, you know, your needs and your wants, something pretty interesting that you can do with a credit card, the ones that have rewards, you know, as you um, rack up the points, eventually you have enough rewards to buy, to be able to freely get um, like, a, say a Best Buy card, a gift card of some sort. Correct. So now, now you don't have to tap into that money you set aside, your savings. Now you have you know, your $25 gift card, $50 gift card. You can now go use that on the extras. It really helps your overall spending and your budget. Uh, uh, agree. Uh, you know, one thing to, again, keep in mind, especially for those that are getting their first credit card, and you had talked about it earlier, uh, the wants versus the needs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really try to use your, your credit card for, um, some of the, 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 the purchases that if you can't pay right away, um, that uh, you realize that you're going to be paying a pretty high percentage of, of, of interest rate to carry over those, those minimum payments month by month. But most credit cards now have on their statement to you, uh, one, what it costs to pay it off in full, or two, what it would cost to pay it off over time. Right. And all you need to do is look at those statements mm -hmm. and you can pretty, pretty, pretty quickly realize I'm better off paying those off as soon as possible just because of the, the interest rate that, that accumulates on a, on a monthly basis. That's for sure. And one thing I always caution first time credit card users is, you know, just because you can afford your minimum monthly payment doesn't mean you should max it out. <laughs> you, you know, be smart about it, build that budget and try to pay it off as quickly as possible. Try to pay it off every month. I know a lot of people in the U.S. struggle with credit card debt. What would you say to someone who couldn't afford to make their credit card payments? Um, that is one of the issues that, you know, seminars like this, we, we hope to advert with people and really make it a priority. Uh, ignoring your credit card bills will not make them disappear. Uh, they'll continue to, to incur late fees and, and high interest. Um, we talked about monitoring and credit cards are no different than your debit cards. Uh, if there's one thing that we can take away today and stress is that every time you use either a debit card or credit card, you think back to how am I gonna pay this off and right. when. Uh, credit cards are particularly prohibitive um, in, in terms of late fees and, and compound interest that you'll pay. Um, it's a necessary tool when you're starting out to mm -hmm. help build your credit. So we're not discounting that at all. And we'll talk about how to build credit and what things to watch out for in a few seconds. But um, the best thing I can tell folks is, yes, uh, people get themselves in, in trouble very quickly uh, with their credit cards because they look at what they have available. And, right. and most credit cards starting off would have something in the neighborhood of a thousand, fifteen hundred dollar balance. So people feel I'm good up to fifteen hundred dollars. Right. You are, but then you have to pay it back. And, the, and, the, and the, uh, the length of time that you take to pay it back, that $1,500, say if you maxed out your card, could easily, over a year, turn into $3,000 in total payments. It really can, and Steph, <laughs> Stefan, it's like the snowball effect. Okay, I was late on my payment, so now I have a $35 late fee, but guess what, I'm over my limit. So now on top of that, I'm, I have an over the limit fee. So now my little $35 monthly payment, all of a sudden I owe $150. $150 for my minimum monthly payment. And when I make that payment, guess what? I'm still gonna be at my limit. So just, you know, just use it wisely. Make sure you make your payments and you know, just keep track of your budget.
Uh, regarding credit card debt, is there a difference between good debt and bad debt? I wouldn't necessarily frame it that way, uh, but I will talk about uh, your credit score and the importance of establishing one, um, which is really the audience that we're trying to talk to today primarily is getting started. Um, yes, we, you need to establish credit. But yes, remember, you need to monitor what you spend when you're doing that. Um, and also remember that when you have credit cards, what you're doing is you're now opening another door uh, for people to possibly use your credit for their, for their purposes or fraud. So there are a number of ways that, that we go about looking at establishing credit, but let me just step back for a second. Uh, establishing a credit score, and pe people have talked about that a lot, is to me the singular uh, most important thing that any uh, new credit person needs to, to, to keep in mind. And uh, just some quick basics, there are three uh, national uh, credit scoring agencies. Right. Uh, and uh, they keep track of the amount of credit that has been offered that you've been that you've been granted, they keep track of your your payment, um, and they keep track of, as Chris was saying, the amount of available credit. So your credit limit, say on your on your first credit card, could be fifteen hundred. Um, the credit companies will actually ding you if you go up to that fifteen hundred maximum. You have it available, but they 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 actually score you on credit availability. So. I know it sounds like a lot, mm -hmm. but it, it, it really isn't. There are some necessary things that we need to, to, to do, and this is where your bankers come in handy, because you can have a conversation with us about what's the best way to uh, monitor your particular spending habits and utilize your credit. But credit score is very important, uh, as, uh, because as you go forward and you think about buying a car, oftentimes the interest that you'll pay on that car or any other installment loan is based upon your credit score. Um, if you think about or need to have insurance at some, at some point, again, it's based upon your personal credit score. So if you can start out with a, 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 a credit score of over 600, and the goal would be to get it to eight, but if you can start out with a credit score of over 600, which would be typical of, of, of first couple year people, uh, credit scores, uh, that's a good thing. And, and, and again, we talked about goals at the beginning of our conversation. That should be a goal of you. I, if you have to write down anything, I want to you know, have a very solid credit score and we can give you steps on how you can, how you can do that. Right, and, and Stefan, as you said, it really is a process. You know, typically you start out with your first credit card, then maybe from there you get, um, you get a Kohl's card, you, know, you go to a, a store, you get one of their cards, and then eventually, Maybe you get a car loan because it's important to have different types of credit, you know, a variety of credit that really does give you a stronger score, assuming you're paying all of your, making all of your payments on time. So it, it is a process, and as Stefan said, it, it should be part of your goals. Uh, let's quickly touch on credit scores and credit reports. Can you provide a brief summary of what a credit score is and how they impact us? In the simplistic terms, it is looking at, again, your, your total credit availability, the frequency that you're making payments. So in other words, if your payment is due on the first of the month, but they say a late fee won't be charged after the 15th, pay it on the first, because credit companies do look at your, your payment history and paying on time. That's a significant portion of, of your credit score. Um, if you're, if you're late consistently, that's a, a real quick way of reducing your credit score uh, uh, quite rapidly mm -hmm. if you don't pay on time. Um, again, there are three, three companies that monitor that. There are a number of agencies that, uh, in, including our bank and some other banks, that will provide you a yearly uh, credit analysis, actually a statement showing uh, who you owe in your credit history. Right. Um, and those are important to, 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 to monitor. Uh, as Chris was saying, your credit score is part of your goals that should be addressed at least yearly, but I would suggest you know, uh, doing it monthly. Just say, look, where am I at? What am I spending? What is my goal? Uh, and, and work toward that. 
it, it, it sounds difficult, but it's not because once you get into the habit of doing that, uh, it's, it's something that you would do all the time. On a national basis, and we'll give you a, an 800 number and a, and a website that you could call, but they offer free uh, credit reporting that takes into account all three of the, the credit reporting agencies. And that's important. It's, and I, I have, even for myself and my family members, I look at it, I, I check with this website uh, yearly. Every time that I suppose to change my battery on my smoke detector, that's my clue and reminder to check the, the credit score. I have actually found in the last couple of years um, uh, things that were on my credit report that I, w I either wasn't aware of or they weren't mine. And uh, those that were not mine, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's a way of checking with those people that registered that and to uh, basically appealing it to say, no, this was, this was not my charge. Um, especially when you, you get into online payments and some of the other automatic payments that may come out of your credit card or your debit card, um, sometimes it just could be a misapplication. They, they transpose a number, so your payment could have been posted to someplace else and then you get a bad, a, a bad credit ding. But again, if you're checking on it and you can explain it, um, most of these, most of the time, you will not be penalized, but you have to check. Right, and something, a couple little things I'd like to mention about the credit reporting. Um, I know a lot of times, you know, when you get your first or second credit card, it's like, oh my gosh, that was so easy. I should get a bunch more. <laughs> well, please keep in mind that anytime there's a credit inquiry, um, that does affect your score as well. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're not applying for credit cards. You know. Unless, it's, unless there's a good reason behind it because it will actually lower your credit score. And also with the credit reporting agencies, you know, the um, credit monitoring agencies, as Stefan said, if you find a mistake, it's so easy, you just dispute. Um, whatever you have in question, you dispute it online. And so then the credit reporting agency will reach out to that creditor on your behalf and explain that, hey, this, this person is disputing this charge, and they have a certain number of days where they legally have to research respond. and re respond and reply to it and have some sort of resolution. So I absolutely agree. Monitor your credit. Um, I check it weekly because you, you, you just never know. You just never know. I even set up alerts where if there is a credit inquiry using my social security number, I get an alert. So there are a lot of ways for you to protect your credit and to monitor your credit. And there's this one thing additional I, I want to point out. Um, in this day and age of advertising and infomercials, um, typically you'll find um, paid services to, to help you with your, mm -hmm. your, your credit and your credit scores. Um, I'm not going to say if they're good or not. I will say that you don't need to do that. There are free services available. Um, that, are, that are, as just Chris has said, that are very easy for you to file a dispute. And then by law, they need to respond to you uh, and to your creditor uh, in a certain period of time to, to, to resolve those. So you don't have to pay. I would suggest that you do not pay right. for, for any paid credit services. Uh, these things are available through your bank and, and through uh, national credit reporting bureaus. So what are some easy ways you can boost your credit score? I would say paying your bills on time every month if at all possible, pay the balance in full. Uh, you never max out your credit cards because when you do max them out, then that decreases your available credit and it lowers your credit score. So really be smart about how you spend your money, pay your bills on time, try to pay them off. That really will have the best effect on your credit score. The other uh easy way, uh, but again, we need to monitor it, mm -hmm. is to, for reoccurring monthly bills, set up uh, automatic bill pay. Uh, as long as you have the money in the account. Right. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those, 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 uh, those, those uh, payments, um, telephone bills, uh, uh, car, utility, payments. car payments, uh, utilities, they will automatically come out of your account, and it's and it's one way of, of making sure that you do get that you are paying your 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 bills on time. Before we uh, open it up to Q and A with the audience, is there anything else you'd like to add? I would say um, don't ever, if you ever have a banking question, come on into the branch. 
talk to us. We're more than happy to answer your questions. We don't always have the answers. Sometimes we learn when we research answers to your questions. So there's never, never feel funny about asking a question. We're there to help you. In fact, we like it when people come in. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we like meeting our customers. We like to know their face and their voice. So, you know, we are there for you. We're a customer re relationship business, and we truly like to interact with our customers. So s stop by the branch anytime. Yeah, you know, Chris, you're correct. And as we talked about, you have so many choices available to you now. Uh, and so if you're, if you're starting to establish your credit and starting to open up uh, a banking accounts, I would say, you know, have that conversation with your banker. Talk about what goals that you, you, you want to have, short term and longer mm -hmm. term, and and uh, choose the right product for you. Um, we are live bankers, as Chris said, so we're here to answer questions. We, en we enjoy that. Um, one of the things when you have a lot of choices, uh, it can be very confusing. But the thing I wanted to, to stress is there's no dumb questions. <laughs> and uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's wise to, to answer, or, or should say to ask uh, any question that, that you may have so that you're comfortable um, in utilizing the services that are available to you. But we're here to help. Uh, I would think that most bankers are. Um, and uh, we enjoy talking to people, especially those that come in with a plan that that they that they want to establish a good credit and a good banking relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, it's a breath of fresh air for us when we talk to younger people, uh, and they understand what they need, and uh, they have visions of what they want, and we'd like to help them achieve those. Well, thank you for allowing us to spend some time with you today. Um, please feel free to reach out to us with any questions you may have. You can reach us at the link on the system. Um, to our to our local branches or to our customer service center. But as always, we look forward to meeting face to face with you. So please feel free to call or stop by any of our branches at your convenience. Thank you. Have a great day. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the webinar um, and got many of your questions answered. We did receive quite a bit of um, Q and A in the chat box, and we are going to go through those with our live panelists today. Well, I'll take that question if you don't mind. Um, I don't know that it's, I don't believe that it's really important for people to now have cash in their pocket. I think the most important thing is that everyone understands the value of cash. And in fact, I think by using your debit card, you're able to better track how you're using every penny in your account. Because I know, you know, sometimes if I would have cash, I'd withdraw money and spend it on some of my bills. At the end of the weekend when I was done shopping, sometimes I would wonder, what did I do with all of that cash? So I think really using the debit card allows you to more closely monitor and even create a budget. Great, great. Um, another question we had is how do I pay my bills through the bank? Chris, I'm gonna give that to you as well. Okay, <laughs> well, um, I think the best way to pay your bills is through our online banking, we offer free bill pay. So what you do, once you log into your online banking, if you have your bill in front of you, you simply enter the information from your bill. You know, who are you paying, what's their address, and what's your account number, and what dollar amount do you want to pay? Um, this way, you're pushing your payment out to whoever you're paying, and it's, it's a really good way to do this because your account number, your information is not compromised. No one has your account information. So I I think that's really the safest and the, the easiest way to pay your bills from the bank. Yeah, and as we've talked about several times and mentioned earlier, um, tracking and monitoring your expenses and how you're paying, uh, who you're paying, helps you really establish a budget. Mm -hmm. um, it's still amazing to me when I do it, what I do spend money on. Yeah. So by looking at your mm -hmm. debit card and you can actually see what those expenses are as well as setting up automatic bill pay, it just helps one really budget themselves better. There's always gonna be unexpected expenses, no, no question, but uh, you would like for those to, um, to, to not be the norm. Mm -hmm. And, right. and being able to control your, your, your budget and your, and your spending uh, as it relates to your goals that you have for your overall budget. So as we've talked about, um, it's not hard, but I would say we need to be consistent with certain things 
And the tools that we have available now will help you develop that consistency. And one is always check what you, and monitor your, what you're spending, uh, check what you're spending. It, it helps in the various ways, not only for your budget, but it also helps prevent fraud. And I know we've had a couple right, questions yeah. on fraud. Absolutely. Right. And something else nice about setting your payments up on bill pay, um, if you have a bill that you consistently pay, you pay every month the same time, the same amount, you can actually set up a recurring bill payment, you know, a fixed amount, um, fixed date so you can set it up every month on the first of the month so that way you don't have to worry about being late on your payments because you know you've already taken care of setting that payment up yeah, so, and I'd like to just add Holly if I could um, and it's really helped me and I know we, we're gonna have a couple of questions on credit card and credit card usage mm -hmm. um, I've even in, in everyone who has a credit card you'll see that you can uh, you have options but they always put a minimum payment amount in there and uh, what I've done, because I do travel, and sometimes it is, I, I might miss that payment date, and you never want to miss a payment date, um, is that I set up the fact that I will always have at least the minimum payment amount from my credit cards that I use on an ongoing basis uh, set up automatically to be deducted from my, from my checking account. So it just, it's just a tool that helps me stay on track and make sure that I'm making my payments on time. Great idea. That, that's great, that's great. Another great question we have out there with student loans really being the, the topic and, and with uh, the, young, um, the young kids out there, do student loans affect my credit score? Absolutely, I can speak to that because of my two children <laughs> that are still paying off those loans. In fact, one is in graduate school, so he's incurring even more. Uh, but yes, it does affect your credit score. Um, it, but it goes back to the basic simple principle of pay that, that, that minimum or pay that, that, that the amount due when it's due. Um, that's the, the critical thing. Um, it also can affect your credit score in terms of, and not as much as paying on time, but it also can affect your credit score in, term, in terms of your total debt that you have as it relates to your income. So yes, it does, but there are many services, including those if, um, if you're having student loans coming from an institution, there is help in, in financial advisors at that institution that you set up your, your student loan to that can also assist you in uh, being the most effective in, in handling that. Great, great. Um, I know I had a question offline, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and ask it. I have I have two uh, two boys that have finished their schooling. They're on to you know past college now, and, and beginning to experience a lot of the first time first time home buyer, first time you know a little bit earlier car, et cetera. Can you talk about uh, the value of good credit versus bad credit when it comes to these first time decisions um, in life and how that might impact that? Sure. Um, there's a there's a rule of thumb that, uh, especially in, in this world where so much is automated, um, a lot of decisions really come down to what your credit score is. And we talk about how to, how do we keep your credit score as high as possible. And that's important. And again, it goes back to the basics. I'm going to repeat myself. Everyone says, my kids particularly say, I always repeat myself. But it goes back to um, paying your bills on time monitoring how much you're paying and how much that affects your, your income coming in. But once you do that, you have to also realize how credit scores uh, affect so many things in your life and it impacts them really in a financial manner. Um, a good credit score versus a, a poor credit score could mean as much as 30 to 40 percent more uh, that you would pay for, say, uh, a car payment or any installment mm -hmm. loan. So. Um, as we were talking a little bit earlier, if, if your budget calls for a $300 a month car payment, if you have a good credit score, you now can afford a $400 a month car payment so you can actually get a better car. Um, so because of that, I know employers also look at uh, credit scores, especially for your first couple of jobs because they're trying to get a, a barometer, a feeling for what kind of person you are, are you responsible? So employers are looking at your credit scores. Uh, insurance companies, when you, when, you, when you have your insurance, that is based on credit scores. Almost everything financial now is based upon a credit score, and uh, the, the benefit of, of, of monitoring that and working toward a goal of having a very good one is actually money in your pocket. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, another question we have is, does carrying a balance on your credit card help your credit? 
I would say carrying a balance on your credit card does not help your credit. In fact, um, I would recommend that if you're able to pay your credit card, credit card in full every month, do that. Um, that way you don't run the risk of having a late payment. Um, so pay as much as you can on your credit cards. I know from time to time you may have a small balance, but the lower the balance on your credit card, really the more positive effect it will have on your overall credit score. Great. Um, next question. I'm starting to look at colleges and what tips do you have when it comes to that and financial planning? Well, I would say when it comes to um, looking at a college, first I'll try to, if you identify what your interests are, what you think you may want to study at college, take a look at the two-year programs, four-year four -year programs, or even the trade schools, you know, because there really is quite quite a difference in how much you're going to pay and also take a look at different colleges to see you know perhaps for you know I mean it can vary greatly how much you're going to pay at a local college versus an out-of-state college or a private college and it's also very important to take a look and see are there different grants are there scholarships that you could apply for I know most communities have maybe a rotary club um, a chamber of commerce things like that quite often they are looking at their local schools to give seniors at high school some sort of scholarships so I would say spend a lot of time you know looking at the different schools talk to your advisor at your your local high school you know, because they're a wealth of information and again they can tell you about different grants different scholarships and then Steph I'm going to turn it over to you to talk to that as well well no Chris you're absolutely correct uh, the basic though and, and, you, and you probably already mm -hmm. know but if you don't uh, there is a federal form called a FASB and what it does is it's basically a, a financial snapshot of um, your family's ability to pay uh, for school and most scholarships and grants are based upon that score that comes with with the FASB and again um, all of those forms should be available uh, through your high school and if not I know they're available through whatever institution that you're applying for uh, to get it it's going to take a while to, to, to fill it out and it's, mm -hmm. and it's a family affair <laughs> uh, because they're, they're looking at the your, your, your parents or guardians or anyone else that's close to you, your immediate family in terms of your ability to help you and assist you and pay for college. But it's well worth it uh, because mm -hmm. uh, it is good for four years, that, that, that score. Uh, you also have the ability to dispute it in case they come with something different. Uh, so, but it's the baseline for uh, really determining uh, how much money you might be eligible for in either terms of scholarship or grant. Okay, last question. Okay, great. So uh, we have time for one more question. Um, Can you see it? <laughs> no. Uh, it's from Latisse Robinson. Okay. Uh, she says, thank you. I'm older and I'm seeking to repair my credit. What do you suggest? What I would suggest when it comes to repairing a credit, first off, any credit that you do have, make sure you, you make your payments on time. Um, if you have any credit perhaps that was charged off, which means that you did not make your payments on time and say it's a credit card company and they decided to turn your credit card off and if you still owe them money reach out to that credit card company and make payment arrangements on any debt that is showing up on your credit report that is negatively affecting it um, also if you have any medical bills showing up on your credit report reach out to whoever that creditor is and see if you can make payment arrangements with them because once that's removed and showed paid as full, that will have a huge impact on your score. And then typically when you're really trying to rebuild credit, most likely you're gonna to have to start off with a credit card. That may mean that you're gonna, when you apply for a credit card, you may need, need a secured card. What that means is maybe they give you a $300 limit and you need to deposit $100 with that credit card company. That allows you to then rebuild your credit, start using that credit card. And I would say, you know, don't get in trouble again with your credit, with your credit, with your debt. 
pay it off every month because the last thing you want to do is to fall into bad habits or you know even if it wasn't bad habits maybe there was something in your life that prevented you from making the payments but really start off on on the right foot and pay everything in full start out slow and after you have one credit card you'll probably be able to get another one and then eventually you know a, a car loan but really take baby steps and try to pay everything off monthly uh, Chris Excellent advice, and just the one thing I would add to that is um, just the fact that you are in the mode of thinking I need to repair my credit, mm -hmm. uh, and you're doing inquiries to your debtors, uh, you would be <laughs> you would be surprised on, on how those work and pe people trying to work with you uh, to re to reestablish your, your mm -hmm. credit, and that also uh, will show up uh, on, on your credit report and and will help those uh, help that number rise. Right. Great, great. Well, um, we're coming to an end today, and I would like to again thank our panelists, uh, Stephen Holmes and Chris Barker from First National Bank, partnering with the YMCA of Greater Cleveland, and to all the viewers out there on this important topic. I hope uh, every one of you found some value in what you heard today. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.